Uh, I stepped down as Bishop of Wilsden in 2021 and I, I keep on getting people asking me the, the old question, literally the old question, how is retirement? Uh, to which I have two reposts. Uh, one is Christians never retire. Uh, there's still so much to do by God's grace uh, for the mission of the church and the evangelism, evangelization of England. So I'm still carrying on doing stuff. Um, and secondly, there's a real freedom when you stop being a bishop, I tell you, uh, because you, you step down and you can just do all the things you were ordained for. You can be in local parish churches, which is what I do most of my time, different places, different Sundays, uh, and uh, you're one such, a bit of a different sort of parish church, but nonetheless a parish church, uh, and very good to be with you. So there's real contentment in retirement, and I can recommend it to you. The um, glasses are funny, I'll tell you why. I've just had a cataract or two cataracts done. Uh, so I, from being short-sighted since I was eight, uh, I am now long-sighted, which is completely bizarre. Uh, and I need glasses for reading. So I've got these things until they sort them out. So six weeks after your cataracts, they get you a new prescription. In the meantime, I'm going... <laughs> so I, I can now see you all clearly at the back, but now I can't. <laughs> but I can read my script. Charlie's invited me uh, to speak on partnership, and I refined that a bit by uh, taking the title Partnership and Proclamation. Uh, as uh, Charlie and I discussed when we were having the interview earlier on, uh, one of the sadnesses of the recent history of evangelical Christianity uh, has been the way in which Christians who hold the same position on the supreme authority of Scripture, on the centrality of the cross and resurrection, uh, on the need for people to come to a personal experience of faith in Christ for themselves and for the need for active discipleship in the church and in the world, have found themselves in different streams and we haven't necessarily talked to each other, uh, hardly encountered each other. I spent many times, uh, many years, as I said, as part of the leadership of Spring Harvest. Uh, others uh, go to New Wine or Keswick or Word Alive or Focus. Uh, and we don't necessarily meet across our tribes and that's a shame. But in this present crisis in the Church of England, I think we refound each other. We've begun to say, what is it that makes us authentically Christian? And why is it that we want to join together to bear witness to Christian truth? Uh, and we've refound our common purpose to serve God in his church and to stand for an orthodox position over against those who have taken a more revisionist view of things and who wish to change our understanding of salvation, um, who wish to uh, talk about the atonement in ways that we would not see necessarily as biblical um, or sexual ethics in which uh, ways we would not see uh, as biblical. So I come to you this morning uh, really to express that sense that uh, the tribes are coming together uh, and it's a joy to be a part of that. But we need to ask ourselves, what's the theological rationale uh, to be part of being partners in the gospel? Uh, Paul talks about uh, being partners in the gospel in Philippians. He tells the Philippian Christians, we are partners together. Uh, and uh, it's something which became a kind of catchphrase of our previous Bishop of London, uh, Bishop Richard Charters. Uh, those of you who knew him uh, when he used to come and uh, do stuff here in All Souls uh, would say, Dear partners in the gospel, he would say in his very resounding tones. Um, and uh, it's important to hold that phrase and to say there's something which does hold us together. But how are we to decide who are our partners? And conversely, how we decide if there are people we can't partner with? What's the basis for our partnership? Uh, and the gospel passage, uh, which is actually the Church of England's set gospel reading for today, you may not know the Church of England has a lectionary, uh, which tells you what passages are set for each day. So this is uh, the gospel for this particular Sunday. Um, and it's a, a, a passage that helps us understand a bit more, it seems to me, about what it means to be partners. So if you'd like to have your Bibles open, it's uh, page 1085. And it is this prayer that Jesus prays. John 17 is part of John's gospel, uh, 
part of what we call the last discourse uh, from chapter 14 through to chapter 17 uh, before he goes out to meet his destiny through his arrest and trial and crucifixion. He speaks these words to his disciples and in John 17 he prays this prayer overheard by his disciples. It's not very linear in terms of thought pattern. It's quite complicated. It's more like a spiral of ideas as he prays to the Father. But I think we can unpick it uh, as we look at the text together. And it does take us to the heart of what it means uh, to be partners together in Christ. So let's dive into it. And, and you'll see, if you've got the text open in front of you, that uh, the Bible you have in your pews, sorry, in your chairs, beg your pardon, I used to pews these days, um, uh, it divides into three sections. Jesus prays to be glorified, Jesus prays for his disciples, Jesus prays for all believers. He prays to be glorified. The first bit of the prayer is about putting himself into the hands of God and saying, uh, I've come to this moment. The second part, a bit we're going to look at in more detail, is how he prays for his disciples. And then he goes on from, chapter, from verse 20 onwards uh, to pray for all believers. So what does 1 to 5 have to say? Dramatically, he says, the hour has come, glorify your name. Throughout John's gospel, there have been moments where he's been challenged and he said, my hour has not yet come. It's a motif in John's gospel. He picks it up two or three times. My hour has not yet come, I'm not yet ready. But now Jesus, as he prays this prayer to the Father, says, the hour has come, this is the moment I'm launching out into what God has called me to do. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. He is now ready to go to the cross for the sins of the world. And then in verses 16 to 19, he prays for the disciples. We'll come back to that. And then verse 20 onwards, he prays for all those who are to come after him, the Christian church throughout the ages. Uh, and we'll return to that briefly at the end. So let's look at uh, this chunk in the middle, verse 6 onwards. Verse 6, I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. So the focus there is on the disciples, uh, his intimates, the remaining 11 who have shared his ministry these past three years. Notice two things about this. Firstly, it's God who's taken the initiative. God calls us by his grace. God calls us into fellowship with him. Reflect on your own coming to know God in Jesus Christ. You probably weren't necessarily aware of it, but God was there first. He was doing the business. He'd actually already got you. Uh, he was, by his grace, calling you, and you responded in faith. Uh, and you acknowledged Jesus Christ and confessed your sins uh, and became a Christian. Grace calls, we respond in faith. That's what the disciples have done. It's the initiative of grace, that great Christian word, which is perhaps one of the most important words in the Christian vocabulary. Grace, God reaching out to us, God's sovereignty in our lives. And then secondly, they have obeyed your word. It's our obedience to the word of God, taught by Jesus and the disciples, given to us in Scripture, that forms the basis of our partnership with others. And verses 7 and 8 picks that theme up a bit more. It doesn't look like it at first until you understand what lies behind it. Now they know everything, verse 7, that everything you've given me comes from you. I gave them the words you gave me, they accepted them. They knew with certainty I came from you and they believed that you sent me. The disciples still had a very imperfect understanding of what Jesus the Messiah was all about. They hadn't put it all together, but they were getting there. If you read the Gospels, uh, you'll probably sense a huge frustration. Why didn't they get it when he said this? Why didn't they get it when he said, I am the Messiah to them? In, uh, the Son of Man's got to die. The Son of Man's going to be uh, crucified. That, why didn't they get that he was owning some of those Old Testament prophecies about himself? They didn't. But they were coming into it. They hadn't got a complete theology. 
of Jesus the Messiah who was to suffer and die and rose again. But that was worked out in the life of the church and written down post-Pentecost. And so Jesus is placing the disciples in that place where he has revealed all he can to them. They'll get it in the end and they, need, they know that he's authoritative. And he goes on and says in verses 11 and 12, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. Now you need to stroll back to the Old Testament a bit here because the power of the name of God is something that's very significant in the Old Testament. Um, Moses hears God reveal himself. I am that I am. I am has called you. And in knowing God, the Old Testament saints, as they become, the Old Testament people who follow God without knowing Jesus Christ, understood that the name of God revealed to them, drew them into relationship, and was a way of him saying, I have truth to give you, and you are mine, and you are following me. To know Jesus is to know God. To know God is to know who he is and how he's revealed himself. It was true in the Old Testament. Jesus channels that and says, and this is what is true for you disciples. And so here comes my first point this morning. Partnership in the gospel is based on a shared understanding of revealed truth. God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ and through scripture as we now have it. And because of that revealed truth, his trustworthy word is in our lives. And that's quite countercultural in our current society, isn't it? Christianity is a revealed religion. That makes it very difficult for us sometimes when we try to uh, tell the story of Jesus Christ uh, in a relativist culture where my truth and your truth are seen to be of equivalent value. And I think we battle a little bit with the fact that you can't presuppose that people will accept. Here is something that's a given. Uh, here is something where is a God who speaks. It's not an easy platform within which uh, to explain the faith to our friends, our neighbours, our workmates. And yet there is evidence in our culture that people are becoming more receptive to the Christian faith and the way it's shaped our society. I've been enjoying Tom Holland's book, Dominion, The Making of the Western Mind. Here is somebody who isn't yet a Christian, but we're praying for him. Um, and an example of how the Christian story is being taken seriously again. And we need to keep on saying, that is the story we inhabit. We are unapologetic in our insistence that, that Christianity is what Francis Schaeffer called true truth. Uh, and true truth is what we have to proclaim. It's the only story that matters. It's the thing that C.S. Lewis, as he sought to understand uh, myth and old stories, suddenly found that all the myth and the old stories kept pointing back to, to this story of the God who became a redeemer and, and Jesus Christ became the answer to C.S. Lewis's searching. Christianity's true truth. So the basis of partnership in the gospel has to start with the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Can we partner with a church community that doesn't believe in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ? The word made flesh. Can we partner with those who assert the incarnation never happened and Jesus wasn't really uh, God in human form? Can we partner with those who deny that faith in Christ is necessary for salvation? And the answer is certainly not, because they're moving away from the revelation, revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, members of the Church of England have had to face is that we live in what we call a mixed denomination. There are Anglicans who don't accept the faith revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds, which is what every clergy person has to say in their declaration of assent each time they're put into a new job. But we have always been able to assert that the foundations of the Church of England express an orthodox position, that the title deeds of Anglicanism 
belong to those who stand in the evangelical tradition, that orthodoxy is something that we embrace because it's what Anglicanism embraces. Now, the challenges that are now coming to us where Synod is producing prayers that are contrary to Scripture, uh, formulating teaching that's no longer orthodox, put us in a very difficult position. It's never happened before. In liturgical terms, it always used to be the case on General Synod that we had to say all the prayers we produce for public worship are things we can all pray in good conscience as Anglicans. That will no longer be the case with the new prayers that Synod's producing. And in such times, we want to ally ourselves firmly with the revealed truth about Jesus and the revealed truth which he prays for here. So we'll want to be in partnership with those who hold firm to the faith. So that's the first thing. Partnership in the gospel is based on a sh shared understanding of revealed truth. Secondly, partnership in the gospel is based on a commitment to be people who live holy lives. Look at verses 15 uh, to 17. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus prays, sanctify them in the truth. Make them holy. Not holier than thou. Not pious. Not thinking I'm a better Christian than you. None of that stuff. Uh, we are not people who glorify ourselves. We are people who move towards God's goal of sanctification. Christian church has been damaged so badly over the past years uh, by people who put leaders on pedestals uh, and then find that the leaders are precisely the people who are messing up and who are not living the lives of holiness. I, I always say to people uh, who want to put a leader on a pedestal, you know what pedestals are for? They're in WCs. And what you do with a WC and a pedestal is you flush it. So any leader who thinks they're good Flush them down the toilet, because they're not. We are humble servants of Jesus Christ, uh, and no more, no less. Unworthy servants. Sanctification is an old word. Uh, it's fallen out of vocabulary, I guess, of late. But Jesus' desire for the disciples was that they should, because of the truth of God's word and God's love, making its home in their hearts, be people who live robustly challenging a robustly challenging life that shines out as an example of the transforming love of Christ. So we're to be holy people, not holier than thou, but holy people. Look at what Jesus prays. He's not asking the Father to take the disciples out of the world, verse 15. That would be both unrealistic and untrue to our calling. To be a Christian is to live and work and worship and witness in the place that God has put us. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one, says Jesus. It's been a wonderful feature of the ministry and life of all souls over the years, that as a church, uh, you've sought to promote workplace discipleship and to teach people how to live in the world, whether you're someone who works in a workplace, whether you're someone who's at home, whether you're someone in the community, uh, whether you're someone who has a different context of ministry. Uh, and Jesus understands that we are not to be people who cut ourselves off. The holy life is not the holy life uh, which is divorced from the world. And he also takes seriously the malign influence of evil in our lives, the temptations not to live and work as Christ would have us do. We have to da daily pray, deliver us from evil in our business relationships, in our ethical behaviour, in the way in which we treat those for whom we have responsibility or those who lie manage us. This is more of the countercultural and radical calling of those first Christians. And it sets a standard for how we are to be and who are our partners in the gospel and want to share that way of life. So that's my second thing, that partnership on the gospel is based on a commitment to be people who live holy lives as Jesus prayed for his disciples. And then the third thing is there in verse 18. Partnership in the gospel is based on a shared commitment to mission. Jesus prays, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. 
That's the classic verse about mission in John's gospel. Uh, in Jesus' post-resurrection, commissioned his disciples in John chapter 20 and verse 21. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Mission comes down from God through Jesus and goes out to the world. It's vertical and horizontal. It's the classic mission statement. God sends Jesus to earth as the incarnate son. Jesus sends the disciples out to evangelize the nations, to bring the good news of the kingdom. That's the heart of our calling. If we are not missional Christians, then what the heck are we about? We have to share this good news. We can't stop sharing it. It is absolutely fundamental. It's the DNA that runs in us. It's the, the stuff that's in our blood. William Temple, great Archbishop of Canterbury, puts it this way. The apostolic mission of the Son is the pivot of human history, regarded as an arena wherein the divine purpose is being accomplished. All turns on that. Let me read that again. The apostolic mission of the Son is the pivot of human history, regarded as an arena wherein the divine purpose is being accomplished. All turns on that. So how will we identify those who are our co-partners in this task? They will share our love for evangelism, telling the good news of Jesus unapologetically. They'll share our joy when a person turns to Christ and finds new life. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, uh, you're looking to see whether this is a, a faith worth following, well, All Souls is a good place to come uh, because the new Christianity Explored uh, course starts tomorrow. Um, and you'll get a chance to sign up for that if you want to. I think there'll be a gathering place. In, where is it going to be? In the corner? Somewhere? Don't know. All right, well, find Charlie. He'll tell you where to go. <laughs> uh, and uh, join up with that, because that's a place where you can explore the faith for yourself. We rejoice in a church like this when people find Jesus Christ. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the thing about growing in the faith, uh, which I know is dear to your heart, discipleship, uh, helping people grow with faith. And people who are into that will also work with us in the task of bringing the holistic, transformative work of the kingdom into our home, localities, and overseas. People of mission, that's the third thing. Partnership in the gospel is based on a shared commitment to mission. Now, those of you who've been around in the church a long time will, of course, be aware that John 17 has been picked up as the scriptural passage par excellence to be used to call for all Christians to be one. It's there in verse 11 of this passage. Uh, oh, I remember. Holy Father, protect them by your name so they may be one as we are one. And it's there again in verse 20 following this passage. My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those uh, who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. And these have become key texts for the ecumenical movement, for those within the Church of England who want us to stay together despite our disagreements. We are told we're to be one, even when there are fundamental disagreements between us. There's this kind of almost romantic understanding that we can all hold hands and be nice to each other, even when we don't agree at all with each other on these fundamental matters of doctrine. And I want to say that just can't be done we are to be one but only one in terms of the things that precede that oneness I want to suggest you can't read these prayers for unity outside the context of this morning unity does not trump everything else rather true unity is predicated on these three things let me just remind you partnership in the gospel based on a shared understanding of revealed truth Partnership in the gospel based on a commitment to be people who live holy lives. Partnership in the gospel based on a shared commitment to mission. Brothers and sisters, we must not, we cannot partner with those who don't accept the teachings and truth contained in Scripture. Nor with those who believe that the Christian understanding of morality needs to be changed to fit in with the prevailing culture. Nor with those who don't share our commitment to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to all people and to say with the apostles, there's no other name under heaven 
by which people can be saved. If we can't agree on truth, holiness, and mission, we can't be partners. There is no unity. Here's a quote from Bishop Hugh Latimer, who was one of the Oxford martyrs. Unity, he said, must be according to God's holy word, or else it were better war than peace. We ought never to regard unity so much that we forsake God's word for her sake. None of that means we despise unity or refuse to seek after it. But that does mean we have to only accept unity on certain terms. It's no coincidence that uh, we say the Nicene Creed in church, a statement about what we believe about the church of God. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. The church is one. It's given a unity by God. The church is holy. It is full of sanctified people who are still learning to grow as forgiven sinners. Uh, the church is Catholic. It receives the teachings of Scripture, which the church has always taught. And it's apostolic. It's sent out in mission. It has that unity. That unity is defined by the holy, the Catholic and the apostolic. And if those marks are missing, there is nothing around which to unite and you need to seek other partners. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of hearing how you pray for your disciples. And we want to associate ourselves with that prayer and be people who are committed to uh, your life in our life, your revelation of yourself through uh, the way in which you taught and the way in which Scripture depicts you. We want to be those who are associated with your desire that your disciples might be holy and sanctified. We want to be associated with the fact that we are called to be people of the gospel, people who share the faith with others. And so we pray that you may do that for us, and that you'll help us to find unity and partnership with those who share those prerequisites. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.